So my whole goal today is I'm gonna give you a one week workshop in about 40 minutes. My only goal is to, is to just change your paradigm a little bit. There's nothing I'm gonna say right now that you're gonna really remember. I really passed out the book yesterday because the answers that I'm trying to get you to take home with are in the book. There's also a website in the back of the book called back-in-control.com that'll give you the action plan to actually implement these tools. But medicine has gone through a huge, huge rush the last 20 years of technology, which is incredible. We become focused on technology. We have to change the paradigm. Again, we've got to get back to seeing the patient because if we can apply this type of technology to actually helping the patient at the level they need to be, he or she needs to be helped, it'll be unbelievable. But I want to just create one paradigm shift and just two tools. So I want everybody to sit back in your chairs just for a second. And I do this with my fellows all the time in clinic and surgery. And just drop your shoulders for a second. Everybody just relax, drop your shoulders. And we call this active meditation. And when you're in surgery and frustrated, and you're trying to get unfrustrated, what happens to your brain? What happens? Case isn't going well. Staff's guy on your tail. He's on your on your tail. What's your, what's your mind doing? Nothing. Racing. I mean, how do you feel? Is that, if, if I'm on you like I am right now, what's your mind doing? It's racing, correct? I'm talking to you. I'm sorry. What's your name? What is it? Okay, Michael. Sorry. Um, anyway, what's your mind doing? If you're in surgery and things aren't going well. What's your mind doing? Right. And how many have a son or a daughter who's got a baseball game? It's five o'clock. Games at six. How many ever thought about something else besides the operation when you're in surgery? Anybody? Okay. And if if you didn't raise your hand, you're not telling the truth. So the problem is you're going focus, focus, focus. Your mind's on focusing. It's not on the move. So our goal here is we call it active meditation. We do it during surgery. Just drop your shoulders. And there's three parts. It's relaxation, stabilization, and called increasing the vividness. You can do this in clinic, in surgery, whatever it is. You simply put your brain on sensory input. Taste, sound, smell, feel. And what we do in surgery most of the time, we just go to light touch. Because when you're white knuckling things, you've lost your feel you're tense. And when I used to go focus, 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 my mind was on focusing. It wasn't connected to the move, right? So what happens when you just go to light touch, drop your whatever, you still have your feel. You're actually connected to the feel. Instead of doing battle with these crazy thoughts, you're simply connected to the feel. And I probably do that little move probably 200 times in a case. And I'm talking about a micro -disectomy. So it eventually becomes pretty automatic where you simply get connected to the feel. So that's the, one of the tools I want you to leave with here. The second tool is one called negative writing, or what I call mechanical meditation, is that the anxiety and frustration that you experience during surgery is part of the unconscious part of the brain. And you can't control it. In fact, they're showing more and more mental health that when you try to control emotions, period, any emotion, particularly anxiety and frustration, it's dangerous. It is not good for your mental health. It is not good for your performance. So there's a simple tool that's been documented now in over 200 research papers since 1982 called expressive writing, what I call negative writing, is that once or twice a day, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, see if you write down your frustrations. Like, what's this handsome guy talking about? This is crazy stuff. But the data is so deep, it's unbelievable. So I'm just unapologetic with my patients. I'm unapologetic with my fellows. I say, look, the data is right here. Just do it. I'm not going to argue with you. If a patient decides that they don't want to do this tool, I say, fine, I'm just not your surgeon. So that tool has taken 50 of my surgical patients in the last 18 months. They've calmed down the nervous system. They have major structural lesions, which I'll show you in a second, and they've canceled their surgery. And they've canceled their surgery because their pain went away. Okay? So we're a little short of time today. I'm going to go either varying degrees of speed to give you the concepts. I will quit on time regardless where we sort of end up here. But the idea is that we're a select group of people who went to medical school. We did pre-med, we went to medical school, we went through residency, and then for goodness sakes, we became surgeons. 
and then we became neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons, is crazy. Normal people don't become spine surgeons. I mean, think about it. It's insane. So why do we get here? How do we get here? And so one of the thoughts I want to leave you with is that the same energy that took you up the hill is going to take you down the other side, just no matter how steep the descent is and what style you're going to do it in. And so maybe don't crash and burn, but guess what? You don't live the full and rich life that you need to listen. All that affects your performance with patient care, et cetera, et cetera. So we talk about putting it all together. We, spent, we have a huge emphasis here in trying to get our fellows to become physicians, not surgeons. I mean, our volume here is ridiculous. The complexity of care we have here is huge. So we never worry about a fellow leaving here not being adequately surgically trained. That's not the problem. The problem is that all of us are pretty wired, moving forward pretty fast. And this is the, one of the emphasis of our fellowship. So the purpose of the talk today is basically to understand it is critical to assess all aspects of a patient situation to make an accurate diagnosis and implement an effective treatment plan. And as you know, medicine right now is very, very focused just on structure. But this requires listening. Okay, so all of us think we're pretty good listeners, right? We're doctors, we're physicians, et cetera. And well, my goal is to show you that we really probably aren't listening exactly the way we think we're listening. Disease in man is never exactly the same as disease in an experimental animal. For in man, the disease at once affects and is affected by what we call the emotional life. Thus, the physician who attempts to take care of the patient while he neglects this factor is as unscientific as the investigator who neglects to control all the conditions that affect his or her experiment. One of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity, for the secret of care is in caring for the patient. Has anybody ever heard that quote? Does anybody know where that came from? Take a guess when it was written. 19, actually Ulster is one of the people who also stated the same. It was Francis Peabody in 1927, very famous. He was actually teaching medical students at the time. And he was discussing basically, basically patient care in the hospital where the patient's lying there with stomach pain and all the diagnostic tests are negative and they send the patient home anyway. So the problem is think about this carefully is that it's much more logical for say someone comes with stomach pain and they're in a horrible stress at home, maybe they're being abused, who knows what's going on, financial losses, et cetera, <clears throat> to have a knot in their stomach or to have tension in their back or whatever. It's much more logical for the human body to respond with a physiological response and have a structural problem. So just because you did an upper GI, lower GI endoscopy, et cetera, it doesn't mean the stomach pain isn't there. The problem is when you're under stress, all of you, and I want you to take this personally, your body secretes adrenaline, it secretes cortisol, it secretes serotonin, et cetera. And that's a very simplistic view of what's going on. There's endorphins involved. So your body chemistry changes when you're under stress. There's a book called Love, Medicine, and Miracles by Bernie Siegel, who documented a 10 times mortality rate in people that were unhappy versus happy over 30 years. Took a Harvard cohort, followed them for 30 years, and found a 10 times different mortality in people that were, quote, unhappy versus happy. So if you think that you're handling stress and just being tough and getting through it, you're wrong. Your life outlook changes your body's chemistry. Let's see, what do we do with this? Oh, there we go. So I want to just define the problem a little bit. I, don't, I want to spend more time on the solution than the problem, but let's look at the problem in terms of society, the patient, and the physician. So just really briefly on society, you all know these numbers that basically disability costs around $635 billion. This one always stuns me that 5% of patients consume 55% of the medical resources and over 100 million people in the United States have chronic pain. So what does that tell us? We have better technology. We know more about the human body. We have an endless amount of resources. The medical, and plus, as you know, these costs are all rising. So the SSDI stuff is projected to go up another 30% in the next five or 10 years. The percent of people in the workforce that are working is only 63% now. So medicine is failing. And everybody knows the famous quote by Albert Einstein is that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. So as you're sitting here, as I'm standing here, our training has not taught us how to solve the problem. We're still doing procedures. 
We're still turning into a very quick, efficient industry, and our society is becoming more ill. That's not okay. Look at the, look at the perspective from the patient's problem. So look at the clinical care, their perspective, what's called mirror neurons. Now, I'll just ask one quick question. How many in the room enjoy taking care of a patient in chronic pain? Okay. A huge part of that problem is that you have to have a correct diagnosis to make the correct treatment paradigm. So this is actually outside the scope of this talk, but if you don't know what you're really doing without the tools, you can't enjoy the process because you're going to fail. So look at this problem from the patient standpoint. Remember, over 100 million people have chronic pain. That's probably conservative if you look at the true definition of chronic pain. It's, a, it's going to be probably over half your practice, and nobody in the room is going to enjoy this, including myself historically. So I gave a lecture at my own clinic a couple of years ago on enjoying the management of chronic pain. I love it. It's the most enjoyable part of my practice. And it's really rewarding to see somebody who has no hope, make a correct diagnosis, and watch them within three to six months come out of the hole. There is nothing more rewarding than seeing that happen. But right now, we know that surgeons have a limited capacity to assess chronic pain risk. So he gave us called a DRAM to 124, 125 orthopedic patients prospectively, and they found a certain number of patients who are distressed or at risk. And then they asked the surgeons to rate the patients, and only 26% of the time were they correct in the patient at risk. Another study showed a 45% risk, or chance of actually identifying a patient. So all of us in a bit of a busy clinic, we own patients working full time, whatever, this is a great patient, right? No disability, no medical legal. That's about as far as we go. This can be figured out on a spine questionnaire in about 30 seconds. So you see, you have somebody who came in with working, motivated, all these things that are great. They just lost their job, or the kid just put in, or the kid just got put in jail, or their daughter has an eating disorder. Okay, those cause stress. So situ situational stresses are a big deal. So the bottom line is in the middle of a busy clinic, you simply cannot tell, even though you think you can tell, you cannot tell who's at stress or not. Plus, when I first started practice, we used to get psychological screening, you know, fair, fair amount of the time. We didn't necessarily do the right thing with it. You know, we sort of assessed them, say, okay, no surgery, surgery, but we sort of did the surgery anyway. But a recent paper out of Baltimore showed that only 10% of orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons are using routine psychological screening. And the community is actually a little bit more compliant than academic. And they documented depression, longer recovery, increased complications, poor patient compliance. We all know this. I mean, I don't think this is news to anybody in this room, right? And then you were here with the technology people. There's a huge thrust. And these people are very well-meaning. And I really take my hats off to the intensity of their wish to improve health care. Because guess what? They're part of the healthcare system themselves. But we've maxed out the technology. I mean, we can't have better screws. I mean, the instrumentation I used in Minneapolis when I trained was we try to put two clamps on a pedicle screw to try to put a rod in. It took an hour to do a one-level fusion just to get the hardware in. And then cervical thoracic junction stuff in the last five years has been unbelievable. You know, our navigation system, I mean, it's unbelievable. So, I mean, there's really nothing technology-wise that's going to really change what we do. So we have to figure out another way to improve the outcomes. There's a, there's a book out called Love at Goon Park, G-O-O-N, and it was a nickname for the lab of Harry Harlow at University of Wisconsin at 600 N Street. And basically he did primate research, and he was the first one that showed that love matters. B.F. Skinner and leading psychologists in the first 50 years of the century taught that mothers should not touch their kids, and orphanages would have a formula. They would put eight kids per area, they had four sheets that surrounded these kids, and the nurses would come in three times a day and change the clothes and feed them. The mortality rate was 30%. They compared that to prison mothers who play with the kids every day with no mortality rate. So here's a you know, wire monkey. I think most of you have seen this with the problem where you, know, you have the wire monkey with food and the cloth monkey with you know, warmth, whatever, and of course the monkeys prefer. And even if they're on the warm blanket, they still want to stay on the warm blanket to be fed. So Harry Harlow was challenged because he induced all sorts of bizarre behaviors in these monkeys over years. And, you know, obviously doing isolation experiments that would never pass the muster today, but he could never induce depression. So he finally figured it out. Yet another disturbing experiment for his laboratory workers 
where you put monkeys in a cage, and they could climb up the sides, and of course instantly fall back down. But they had a, they had a screen on top that they could actually have a little bit of hope. So within four to six hours, they quit climbing, they sat on the bottom of the cage, they wouldn't move. When they pulled them out of the cage, even relatively quickly, when they got back into their own society, they remained depressed. So we actually successfully created a depression model of monkeys by repeatedly dashing hope. We promised our patients all these treatments. We know the data for epidural ejections isn't very good, spine surgery all over the map. We feel compelled to do something. So when we do that, doing something, which right now is not very enjoyable for any of us, we're dashing hope over and over and over again. We're actually creating depression. As a medical profession, we're actually creating that depression. And it took actually a good another four to six months of active treatment to get these monkeys back functional again. So it was a pretty, and the, the laboratory was, of all the experiments that they did, they were really disturbed about this one because it happened so quickly. But the final thing, as far as the phys medical profession, is one of the reasons I've concluded, for me personally, but probably for you, you've all heard of the process of mirror neurons, how we all learn. And when a quarterback throws a football down the field at a professional football game, that part of your brain lights up. You feel like you're throwing the football. So when you smile at a baby, the baby smiles back, not because the baby's happy, you stimulate that part of the brain, okay? So if a patient comes in and you are dealt with a really angry, vindictive patient, what happens to your brain, okay? It's stimulated. So we're all pretty high strung anyway. This patient comes in and triggers us. It's not a pleasant experience for us. Then we're triggering the patient back. That's a problem. So our brain spirit neurons underlie our intensity and social nature. It's how we interact, but it goes both ways, right? Positive and negative. So you look at this picture, you know, you sort of recoil, and you look at that, feels pretty good, right? Your brain instantly did that. It wasn't a big lecture, it wasn't a big talk, simply visually, bam, within a millisecond, why that, that your image changed. The physician problem is a big one, and we've been, I've been training fellows since 1990, and MD stress has, has really increased dramatically. Um, they did a survey in California, and this is actually true in every state that I've seen. 30 to 40% of physicians would not choose to enter the medical field. Less would recommend it to, to their children. And it was Washington, California, Canada. The quote burnout rate is about 55%. My fellow Mark put an article on my desk a few weeks ago um, pointing out the neurosurgery that the burnout rate is 65%. Now, you talk to my son, who's now looking for a job, just found a great job, first job he's had at age 31, he was a competitive skier, he thinks this is crazy. I mean, look, look around you. You have colleagues, you have knowledge, you have prestige, you have future earning power. Why are you burning out? Suicide. I wrote an article for my spine journal um, about 2011 on physician suicide. Um, I have 18 colleagues that are dead from suicide. Um, I was almost number 20. And that's a different story that I'm happy to talk about at some other point. But physician suicide is a huge problem. I have four medical school classmates dead from suicide. One of my best friends walked out of the operating room four years ago, shook my hand, said, nice case, and went out and shot himself. I had my fellow spine fellow out of Minneapolis kill himself. I would also encourage any of you, and I know that there's got to be at least two to four people in this room that have had suicidal thoughts, talk to me. The solution's way easier than you think. I got extraordinarily lucky. I really almost did not make it through. And we are under a lot of stress. We have easy access to methodology. We're also penalized for seeking help. We have no resources. We weren't taught stress management. And we try to seek stress management, we're penalized. I had one of my friends take Ambien and had to go before a whole medical review board at this hospital in California. So we have a lot of complexity. We have long hours and stress affect their personal life. And we're just, we're just overloaded. I'm going to skip this for a second. second. So they have, def, they have a burnout questionnaire. My definition, definition of burnout is pretty simple. Are you a TGI, TGIF person or a TGIM? Thank God it's Friday or thank God it's Monday. I mean, I'm excited about coming to work on Monday. I really like what I do. It's rewarding and it's fun. So don't answer this question. Just sit back and think about that for a second. Are you really excited about Monday? And I'm going to pour a little water, rain a little water on your parade here for a second. 
All of us in surgery are goal-oriented. We somehow think when residency is over, fellowship order is over, the life is going to be easier. How, how many people think that? Anybody think that? No? Okay, that's interesting. I don't believe you. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I don't. I mean, the problem is, I, I mean, Jens, what, what do you think? I mean, I, you think life's easier after residency? <laughs> it goes on. And it gets worse because all of a sudden, it's all on your shoulders. There's no place else to go. You get the full heat. So, but I want to tell you, I want to tell you about the real reason for burnout. And I'm going to put a word up that every time I put this word up in a medical group, people just want to sink through the floor. It's right there. So it is not true that people stop pursuing dreams because they grow old. They grow old because they stop pursuing their dreams. Okay, makes sense. But it makes no sense because all of a sudden you have dreams. You now are closer to actually having the means to achieve those dreams. Why would you not have your dreams? What's, what's going on? So my modification is it is not true that people stop pursuing dreams because they grow old. They stop pursuing their dreams when they are crushed by anxiety. And one of the problems that we get into, and that's why I say relatively normal people really do not become surgeons, particularly neurosurgeons and spine surgeons, but we're perfectionists. And it's a major contributing factor that increases both anxiety and anger. And it's often held as a virtue in the medical field, especially surgeons. I mean, how many in the last six months have been criticized for something that they've done? Okay, just curious. So people say, well, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm going, really? Okay, come on. I have written a whole paper on this perfectionism thing, and you can't drive yourself as hard as we drive ourselves without being a perfectionist. So we say, I just have high standards, a cultural norm, I'm just hard on myself, I'm right, idealistic, it all seems sort of reasonable. But remember, we're, it's like the lobster in the pot being boiled. We actually don't know any better. We have should thinking. We are supposed to be perfect, like as a standard. It does not exist in the human experience. It only exists in the natural laws of nature. That's it. So now you have a scenario where you're anxious about being inadequate, fueled by the frustration of never being able to achieve what you should be doing or not, and you have mentors that are just piling it on. Therefore, the difference in your concept of perfect and your current reality determines the degree of your unhappiness. So genealogy of anger, where you have a circumstance you blame, victim, and frustrated, or angry. So if your circumstance is, if perfectionism is your ideal, you're going to blame yourself for the circumstance for being less than ideal, you're a victim, and you're always frustrated. Well, I won't go into this a lot of detail, but basically, it pushes you higher, there's no mercy, and you don't really understand that anxiety is really driving this whole thing, because that's the only reality. So quote, push me to the top, Minneapolis was considered one of the top three spine fellowships in the world when I took the fellowship, and I felt pretty good about that, okay? But when I got there, I started sweating during surgery. I started having panic attacks. I'm going, what the hell is this? I mean, I didn't actually know what the word anxiety meant until I was 40 years old. I didn't know what the word meant. The first hint that I had anxiety was a panic attack, okay? So even though I intellectually had just stuffed it, my body was not going to let me, was not going to let me get away with this. So I developed an identity which I was really good at wearing. I was positive others, positive thinking. I felt the negative self-talk was what I needed to do to achieve. So it resembled me, but I was actually connected to my labels. I wasn't actually connected to who I was. The problem is it's an illusion, and you cannot accurately assess any situation through labeling. In other words, and again, this is beyond this talk, but. You basically project onto the world your view of yourself. So you label somebody as being a malingerer. Well, maybe you're not working hard enough. Okay, so the labels go back and forth all the time. It doesn't stop. The problem is once you have a label on anybody, yourself included, even if it's a positive label, you've actually lost awareness. You actually cannot hear what's going on. So it's human, but you have to, you have to identify that that thought is a label and find out who that human being is under the labels. So, you know, I have made them take a couple times of asking the physician crowd about what their labels are on their patients. It's pretty brutal. I mean, it's a bad set of labels. And I'm not going put to that, put you through that because I don't want to hear it again. It's really bad. I, I did it myself. So we all know what they are. We all know the different clinics where your staff guys are labeling patients walking out, dirtbags, scumbags, 
you know, pieces of shit, the whole thing. It's all there. Okay? It's right there, right? So I acknowledge a label. I want to find out who is that person underneath my labeling, who is me underneath the labels I have under myself. So what I have found out, as I say, okay, I have this label on the patient, off the street, drunk, whatever, I can never predict who is going to respond to treatment. It's unbelievable how wrong I am. So the solution to the problem, going back to Francis Peabody's concept about taking care of the whole patient, remember if you ignore the patient's emotional life, it's not just a psychological feel-good type thing. The patient's body chemistry changes. It causes physical symptoms. A physiological response is going to cause physical symptoms. When your body's full of adrenaline, there's over 30 symptoms that occur with a body full of adrenaline and cortisol. And I'm doing a research paper for Yen's Journal with cognitive behavioral therapy and the role of treating chronic pain. There's going to be, you know, if you take the systematic reviews that I'm looking at, I'm looking probably at 100 papers, there's several thousand articles documenting how calming down anxiety, sleep, stress calms down pain. It's, it's there. It's deeply, deeply documented. Somehow it has not penetrated the surgical literature. So basically, chronic pain is a complex neurological problem. Traditional psychological approaches cannot work. And it's an unsolvable problem. Not quite. So why is this unsolvable on the current paradigm? It is permanent. It's the unconscious part of the brain, which is a million times stronger than the conscious brain. Your automatic reaction to stress will always be survival. The human body evolved to survive, not to have a good time. The social part of the brain came when humans discovered by cooperating they actually could survive better. But basically, the human chemical response, not necessarily intellectual, but the chemical response is always going to be survival. Food, air, water, whatever it is, not being in pain. So the problem is, with this repetition, these pain pathways become permanent. Not going to change them. It's like unlearning how to ride a bicycle. So between the fact that it's irrational circuits and the unconscious versus the conscious brain, you can talk to psychiatrists all you want. You're not going to solve this problem. So we use positive thinking, mind over matter, determine, over learning, self-esteem. That's how we get to where we are, overachieving all these other characteristics of surgeons. The positive thinking is probably the biggest one that gets people in trouble. It's now become very clear that positive thinking is another way of suppressing negative thinking. So Dr. Wagner out of Harvard wrote a paper called The Paradoxical Effects of Thought Suppression. It was 1987 he published this. He demonstrated the obvious that if you try not to think about something, you think about it more, but you think about it a lot more. Then he pointed out in an essay called The Seed of Our Undoing that if you're a very high-minded person, that you have a higher chance of interpreting a given thought as negative and judging yourself in a negative light. You actually, it's the well-meaning people that have the worst problem with these negative thoughts. So now, 20 years later, you're suppressing these thoughts that keep growing like a parasite in your brain. You're talking to psychiatrists about learning how to ride a bicycle, but also who you're not, okay? So it's like trying to take down El Capitan with a pickaxe. You're not going to solve this problem. Any attention paid to pain, to pain circuits only reinforces them. And again, beyond this talk, mental pain and physical pain are processed in the same pattern of the brain. Okay? So pain diary support groups, discussing medical care. How about complaining about your job and life, reinforcing pain pathways? As pain pathways are permanent, rewiring is your only option. So I'm going to, we're, we're running over a little bit. I, um, Going to give you ends a half an hour here. So I just want to take, we're going to skip the last third of this talk, and I'm just going to go into one set of tools. So does everybody have a piece of paper in front of them? And just think of something that happened in the last, this morning, just was aggravating. Just not deep stuff, but just not, not about the morning. Just take something that just aggravated you. Just do your actual thoughts and feelings. And you're just going to tear it right up. That's what the data says to do. And I'll keep talking here while you do that. And the, sur the, the solutions are basically based on neuroplasticity. You're literally going to rewire your brain in different pathways. And they're now documenting functional MRI scans that with neuroplasticity concepts, you actually change the structure of your brain. Brandon, are you writing there? I'm not letting you with it. Lighty, are you writing? So, okay, well, okay, I'll give you one. So, it's interesting because it's sort of like clinic. I have my patient ask them to do this exercise and they find all sorts of reasons not to do it. No, I'm serious. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because it really does change the brain. The results happen within two to four weeks. It's unbelievable what happens. And the data is every paper written on this. I mean, there's debate on the different types of writing and they call it expressive writing. 
And when you write, all these thoughts come up. They're not thoughts. They're just irrational circuits. So it's just a separation process. So we write a piece of paper. So just I'll, I'll keep talking. Just write down something that's just frustrating, irritating, doesn't have to be real deep. And then as soon as you're done, just tear it up. So your brain is going to respond to where you place your attention, but you have to be aware of what is before you can redo it. So I used to play trumpet in high school. Can't do it anymore. But I could relearn those pathways, right? So again, the four categories of reprogramming are reprogramming, reframing, relaxing, reconnecting. And the reprogramming is we, what we're doing right now is awareness, detachment, reprogramming. Again, I call this mechanical meditation. So you become aware of the thought that's there, and you've separated. Then the reprogramming tool, and they, here's the paper, one of the papers in 2005, the document is 54 papers then about the negative writing. And it's 2015, there's another 100 papers, 150 papers added on to that. And then the act of meditation is what we just did. So we ha I have some cases and stuff that I'm not going to show. Yes? So you're actually just thinking about it and writing it down? Get your brain spinning. The, the thinking is actually the worst thing to do. So if you're a skilled meditator, that's what they do. And I tried this for a couple years. I mean, I tried everything for 15 years. I was in a major burnout for 15 years. And you cannot stop your racing thoughts. So one of the metaphors I use is the eye of the storm. We just picture a hurricane with the wind representing your racing thoughts or circumstances. The tools pull you into the center. You just deal with what you need to deal with. Paradoxically, you have more energy actually to deal with it. But we spend all this energy trying to solve and stop a hurricane. Can't do it. So in mindfulness meditation, the meditators watch the negative thoughts come in. They separate and let them move forward. But when your brain's racing and under the stress that we're doing, I always challenge meditators to come off the mountain and come into the OR, right? So there's something about the writing that's very mechanical. It just does it, and it just starts the process. So take a second, take your breath. Okay, sit back in your chairs. I just want you to feel the back of your chairs. Because remember, this is the unconscious brain that's racing away. You should be putting your brain on sensory input, which is also unconscious part of the brain, and done. You're not analyzing, you're not fixing, you're both de-adrenalizing and calming things down. So again, I encourage you to look at the book, look at the website, just use mental pain instead of physical pain. I'm getting ready to rewrite the book to make that more clear, but they are processed in the same part of the brain, same pattern. And whether it's the operating room, clinic, dealing with your kids, your wife, whatever life, stress life you're dealing with, stress is not the problem it's a reaction to the stress. As you program a different reaction than the automatic defensive reaction, they're now documenting that your brain actually physically changes. This is not a psychological issue. This is a neurological issue. Anxiety is not psychological. So pain is a physical link to the environment. Anxiety is a mental link to the environment. It's just a pathway. Okay, once you understand that, this is not very hard. Any questions? So I didn't get a chance to do, we have, some, we have now almost 50 cases now of very tight severe stenosis going to pain-free without the surgery as they've calmed things down. And I swear some negative writing sort of destroyed my practice. It's been very interesting. But my fellow see it, we have all sorts of people coming into the clinic with just great results, excited, happy. And so really dealing with um, the anxiety around chronic pain has just been incredibly rewarding, both personally and with professionally. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you.